to entrepreneurship and small business management. Small business management. I should really have abbreviated that word, but that's where we are. This is lecture two in this class. And this is the fifth class I have now taught on Twitch. Right? Okay. So, importantly, what is business ethics? Um, business ethics is just about everything you can consider when it comes to a business. You can choose to do more or less ethically. Um, business ethics. So you can choose to do just about everything more or less ethically. You can choose to pay your employees better um, and more in line with company standards. You can choose to pay your suppliers better. You can choose to select your suppliers differently. So business ethics touches just about everything you do. And your degree of business ethics is made up of two primary pieces, right? So the first piece is the bare minimum. So basically, if you fall below the bare minimum, you are hurting your business, right? No matter how much money you think you're saving, the reality is your customers know that you are being unethical. So you want to hit the bare minimum. The second is the industry standard, right? So when you're talking and you're, you're working with different people, um, you're going to end up seeing that you have competition in the industry. And the competition in the industry is very often going to decide what ethical standard you should be at, right? And you have a distinct advantage in raising that standard. And finally, you're going to worry about demographics. Demographics. So when you worry about demographics, you're worried about the fact that your customers might prefer to buy a cup of coffee that was raised by organic farmers rather than uh, someone else. So that's demographics. And finally, on the final stage, you are competing, right? So this is an important piece. So if your demographics def decides that they only want coffee raised by organic farmers, and you take a step forward and you say, I'm going to raise it by organic ethical farmers that are paying a living wage to their farmers that aren't exploiting slave labor and so on and so forth, you are then forcing the industry standard higher. And by forcing the industry standard higher, you are creating a competitive advantage for your company, right? So that's what business ethics is in a nutshell and how you should think about it when you think about businesses both that you interact with and that you might want to start and do on your own. So first and foremost in business ethics is integrity. And integrity is closely related to your reputation in that it's very hard to build up, it's very hard to demonstrate, but it is very, very easy to lose, right? It is very easy to lose, um, and it's very easy to give up. So, integrity reflects on your values, right? The decisions you make, how you treat people, all of those things. And those things are going to be true in your day-to-day -day life, right? Um, so, when you're running a business, the best bet, obviously, is to have the maximum amount of integrity. However, that isn't always feasible, right? So what ends up happening is, let's say you run a pizza shop, and everyone in your neighborhood runs a similar pizza shop, um, and everyone is, is you know buying from good suppliers and using good ingredients. All of a sudden, right, you find out that your customers really only care about the price, right? And a neighborhood pizza shop near you goes ahead and starts buying cheese produced by cows that are in, in you know poor conditions and so on and so forth but they're able to push down the price because of that and they start winning more and more business right so you have two forms of retaliation two forms you can choose to lower your standards you can choose to lower your standards and compete with this other company now, this is a downward spiral and not one I recommend, but sometimes if all eight of the other pizza shops decide to do the same thing, 
you'll be forced into the same problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Or you can advertise your standards. So you can decide that you are going to instead go ahead and work through everything that you can do to say, hey, customers, I actually use a much better brand of cheese and so on and so forth, and I think that you should value that. Whether or not that's going to work is going to both depend on your ability to advertise and whether or not um, people are buying into that kind of thing. So you're going to have to advertise your standards or you're going to have to lower your standards in order to stay competitive. And all of that depends on your integrity. The decisions that you make is depend, depends on your integrity. The second thing that you want to worry about is setting up incentives. Setting up incentives. Right? So, for example, let's say you run a pizza shop and you want to sell more drinks. So, you tell your employees, push the drinks. Right? Maybe you get a result. Maybe you sell 20% more drinks. Just by telling them. Right? Right? But what if instead, let's say every drink costs a dollar, what if instead you told your employees that every time you sold a drink, you would get 25 cents? Okay? Now, your drinks may go up by 40 or 50%, right? 40% more for the incentive. This is the incentive, and this is the command. However, and this is an important piece, they may become, oh man, my whole, my whole setup's moving with this mic, huh? Okay, I got to figure something out with the way I wire this mic here. So maybe, maybe I can put it up here. Yeah, that's actually kind of nice. Okay, so what you end up doing is your employees might be so pushy with the drinks, right? And you can imagine this with other businesses, but so pushy with the drinks that your customers begin to get turned away. And although you're selling more drinks, you're actually selling less pizza. Right? So it's very important when you think about incentives to set them up in a way that affects all of the stakeholders in a positive way. Right, All of the stakeholders in a positive way. So for example, the perfect incentive there, let's say you've identified that most people forget to buy a drink or buy a drink when they're asked. But you want to still set up an incentive to get more results. So you could pay $0.10 cents for every time An employee asks a customer if they would like a drink with their order, right? That makes it well, obviously limited at one time, right? So that your employees don't just stand there and go, did you, like, did you like a drink? Would you like a drink? No, I'm not taking your money. Would you like a drink? You know, that's not going to work. So 10 cents every time, right? And that's one of the reasons that we have a lot of the problems that we do all the time in business is that incentives are set up in a haphazard way. And without really thinking through the natural, the natural progression of those incentives. Because really, most people are going to maximize the benefit to themselves, uh, and they don't really care about your business, right? Um, you could also make them part owners in your business, and that would be very helpful. Hmm. Okay, so... You also have a responsibility to stakeholders, Responsibility to stakeholders. These are not people that hold stakes uh, in the literal sense. But they are your employees. Your employers. Your customers. And your shareholders. So to your employees, you owe an opportunity to work, an opportunity to support their family, an opportunity to earn a living wage, um, an opportunity to improve, right? And the more and more you give your employees, right, an opportunity to pay off their student loans, an opportunity to save for retirement, an opportunity to have health care, right? The more you give to employees, the greater you're fulfilling your responsibilities. To your employers, you owe the work that you're being paid for. Now, a lot of people confuse this with the hours, 
And it's not the hours. Even employers do make this problem where they say, okay, well, I mean, I've paid you to be here for eight hours, so you're going to be here for eight hours. No. The reality is when you're paying for work in any scenario, you're paying for the work to be done. So if the work is done in less hours, you still owe the same amount of money, right? And so that's how you satisfy employers. To your customers, you owe service, you owe product quality, um, excuse me, you owe your integrity and, and you know, your, the truth about what you're, what you're selling, excuse me, what you're doing. And to your shareholders, usually the owners of the business, whether they're investors or individuals, the only thing that you owe to your shareholders is diligence. Right. People confuse this that you owe profit. Shareholders need to make a profit. They're the most important thing. That's a lot of crap. Right. That's a lot of crap because the reality is the truth is that the, the business has to function. Right. So you owe your shareholders diligence. Your shareholders will tell you, OK, I want you to make the maximum amount of profit and you should diligently do just that. But no, no, that if you understand something, if you understand that by make, taking a certain action, you will deprive your shareholder of future profits, right? In exchange for short-term profits, you are going to hurt your employer. And so you should disclose that and share it with diligence, right? Your due diligence. Okay. The next piece of this is social responsibility. Oh, excuse me. The next piece of this is social responsibility. Right, so social responsibility is what we talked about before with ethical farming. Um, a lot of companies don't do it with their suppliers, right? For example, a couple of days ago, I read that Microsoft is now requiring their largest suppliers to have people there that, to have their suppliers guarantee the supplier's employees maternity and paternity leave, right, or family leave, right? So that's a big thing where Microsoft is saying, okay, well, we give you the majority of the business, so we're going to use that leverage to try to do some good, right? And that's social responsibility, right? And you can do this in all kinds of different ways. You can do this by contributing to the environment. You can do this by contributing to your local area and helping support homeless shelters or making food donations or whatever it is. But social responsibility is a way for you to interact with your community and to invest in making it better. And it's something a lot of businesses overlook, but it's something that the most recent generation um, of employees actually puts a pretty high value on when looking for jobs, right? Is whether or not the company is socially responsible. The next thing you want to consider is laws and regulations. Laws and regulations are the very bottom rung. So if if the first level was the bare minimum, the zero level is the letter of the law. Letter of the law, right? So this means that you follow the law directly. Um, you don't violate any of the law, at least as far as you can understand, but you are doing way below the bare minimum. You're just not breaking the law. That's all you're doing. The dangerous thing is, is that this is just one step away from breaking the law. But some industries function in this kind of competitive environment. And the more industries that function in this kind of competitive environment, the greater the regulation tends to happen, right? So the financial industry is a big one in this scenario where regulations will tend to be greater and greater and greater as exuberance exceeds where it should be and companies are barely following the letter of the law. Right, not even the spirit of the law, just the letter of the law, literally what it says, and getting away with as much as they can. Right. So that's laws and regulations. Right. Um, another thing that that the book brings up that's an interesting point is intellectual property. Intellectual property. So intellectual property is a situation where what ends up happening is if you are sitting at your job and you're getting paid a wage to be there and you're spending the time for doing something for yourself and you end up inventing something, 
Companies believe that that belongs to them, right? And to a degree, that's fair. However, the caveat, I believe, will be in the future, and, and it isn't now, but I believe the caveat in the future, because right now it's just what it says in the contract. But the caveat in the future is, if you are working on this thing that the company wants to own, and your manager or your boss or whoever it was came by and saw you, if you could get reprimanded, if you could get in trouble for doing it, then the idea belongs to only you. However, if the company gives you free time, if the company gives you an opportunity to work on your own projects when you're not busy, then it should in fact belong to the company because they are enabling you, right? They are enabling you to do it. And if they are enabling you, then that's a big thing, right? Because in that case, you're producing something for them. And to be fair, I think most people would be happy with this kind of distinction. So that's, that's the piece on intellectual property. Pretty straightforward. Pretty simple. Um, this is another thing that's come up recently that I've seen kind of more and more in corporate culture that I think is a load of garbage is time theft right so time theft is a relatively painless thing it's what we just talked about before it's you know when you're sitting at your job and you're getting a salary but you're also just spending time you know browsing reddit or you know playing some flash games or whatever that's considered time theft now i would agree with this if it was a universal measure universal measure so for example there's a railroad in new york city that runs on a very tight schedule and is usually on time however sometimes it's 30 minutes late right 30 minutes late if time theft is real for that company then they should reimburse me for the 30 minutes that i spent waiting for the railroad simple as fair Right? If I'm working at the company and I get an email or my boss calls me after hours, I should be reimbursed. That's time theft for me. Right? So, this kind of world of one sided contracts with employers is dying. Right? It really is. I think the biggest one that I've, I've personally never respected um, and, and never bothered with is two weeks' notice. Now, you should do as you believe you should, right? My, my environment and my, my opportunities in life are different than your own. Um, two weeks notice, right? So, here's the truth. No employer is going to give you two weeks notice. No employer is going to be like, hey, we're going to fire you in two weeks. Okay, so just sit tight. You'll get another two weeks, and then you're fired. Um, they're not. So, why should I, right? That's the way I've always felt about it. Why should I give somebody two weeks notice if they're not going to even bother doing the same for me? So I absolutely refuse to do this. And, and you know, I don't recommend that you should too because it does burn bridges. But I think we're heading towards a more fair understanding. Now, a couple more things you should know about business ethics. Whenever you talk about business ethics or unethical businesses, you get you hear about the Better Business Bureau. I don't know how true this is for the rest of the world, but the Better Business Bureau in the United States is a for-profit company um, that will allow people to take down reviews that they don't like, um, allow you to pay a fine and, and remove comments that aren't positive about your business. So all in all, what I'm saying is, is the Better Business Bureau is unethical, right? And because it's unethical, it's basically a scam. It's all right to use as a threat. Well, I'll report you to the Better Business Bureau because nobody wants to have to pay the fine. But outside of that, it really is a for-profit company and not a good judge of ethics, right? We've had actually companies now, more recently, things like Yelp and you know Google Reviews where you can't edit your reviews, right? And that's, and that's actually a pretty high ethical standard. So the last two things are social entrepreneurship social entrepreneurship and environmentalism environmentalism right so social entrepreneurship 
talks about specifically driving business for the sake of social good, right? So it's profitable enough to stay alive and stay afloat, but its purpose is social good, right? And this is something we're seeing more and more of. So this is something that is increasing. And then finally, environmentalism, which is your responsibility to the environment, right? I mean, some people live very close to the water. Some people uh, would really suffer if the environment went bad. I think we all would as a whole, as, a, as, a, as humanity, as a species. So um, I think the reality is more and more companies are going to start getting involved in this. One of the things that I've actually seen that's actually worked pretty well are carbon credits. So, for example, carbon credits are traded on the markets, just like any other security or financial instrument, and companies can buy and sell carbon credits. So, if they're reducing their carbon intake, they're able to sell the carbon credits to other companies that need them, right? And if they're increasing it, they're increasing it. And so, there are a limited amount of carbon credits, so the price of carbon credits is going to be continuously increasing. So, the cost of emitting carbon to these companies is actually very real now. And this is one of the incentives that I think is structurally sound and particularly interesting. So carbon credits, environmentalism, and social entrepreneurship. That's the lecture on business ethics. Business ethics isn't all that, all that deep a subject. Um, it's going to matter on a case-to-case -case basis. And we'll go over some cases where business ethics really matters. But at this point, this is, this is a great brief kind of introduction to how to consider business ethics and how to think about it. So